Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews. Today I am interviewing uh, Michelle Jacks. So uh, Michelle, thank you very much uh, for your time today. So if we could start off, uh, I'll let you explain to the viewers at home. Who is Michelle Jacks? So uh, a bit about yourself, like, you know, education uh, wise, um, you know, even employment wise, uh, interests, uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, so first of all, thank you very, very much for interviewing me because mm -hmm. us little party people do not get much exposure. Yeah. So I really, really appreciate your time taking yeah. to actually speak to me. I was born in Southport on the Gold Coast. If you've got people who aren't Queenslanders, they might not know Southport is on the Gold Coast. Yep. But I only lived there a few years. Most of my growing up was in Brisbane. So I'm a Brisbane girl, went to the state schools mm -hmm. in Brisbane, proud product of Kedron State High School. <laughs> I don't know whether you know whether you're a Brisbane boy. Oh, I know where it is, yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful school back then. Yeah. I don't know, might still be also. Um, when I finished high school, I was accepted for a science degree, but I didn't want to do science. I wanted to do music. Mm -hmm. My kids do rub that in a bit. They said they say I should have gone and done the science degree, <laughs> not the music degree. Anyway, I went to the conservatorium and got a Bachelor of Music yep. in pipe organ. And then I wanted to also do a master's. So I got married at the end of my undergraduate degree and started my master's, did a couple of years of my master's. And then we decided we wanted to have a music school, have a business. So mm -hmm. we moved to the Gold Coast to start a Yamaha music school. Yep. And also had a child at the same time. And when I look back and I say, we did this and this and this, it's like, ooh, okay. At the, at the time, it didn't seem like, you know, anything special. Yeah. Um, we ran that business for over 10 years on the Gold Coast. And... I had another child, was still doing my master's, eventually graduated with my master's, and then had a third child, and then we decided I wanted to go around Australia, mm -hmm. and the business wasn't thriving, mm -hmm. So we and my husband was commuting to Ips Ipswich to work at the time, yep. and we decided, well, we will fold up the business, go around Australia, and then move to Ipswich, mm -hmm. which is what we did. Okay. Um, so that was, you know, having my own business all that time. It was a great experience, even though we didn't really make much money out of it. It was worth doing. I would do it again if I had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I was working then in a big church in Ipswich, well, a bigger church in Ipswich for just part time, also homeschooling my kids mm -hmm. before homeschooling became a thing with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know all about that side as well, education. Mm -hmm. My kids all went off to high school when they got to high school age, and they wanted to. I would have allowed them to stay home if they wanted, but they didn't. They wanted to go off to high school, so they did. Yep. And then I decided I needed to pivot because I didn't have a proper job. So, and my husband is older than me. So I thought, well, I better get a real job uh, rather than being this quintessential struggling musician. Yep. So I decided, I picked from... I narrowed it all down i was going to be a police officer or a diversional therapist mm -hmm. which i don't know have you ever heard of diversional therapy no i haven't and i'm pretty sure most of my viewers probably yeah. haven't either <laughs> yeah well probably not well look um shooting is a hobby and that actually could be part of diversional therapy right it's lifestyle recreation therapy there are actually degrees down south there's nothing in queensland okay so i did a certificate for at tafe in leisure and lifestyle it's or health and leisure or something like that so it, it qualifies you to do lifestyle activities in nursing homes disability fields okay. and even um correction centers yep because any institutionalization they sort of their need lifestyle activities and opportunities for people to actually have lifestyle mm -hmm. so then i worked in nursing homes for five years okay. doing lifestyle so i know all about how broken the aged care system is the nursing home system and even though i really appreciate having that experience and i learned a lot from it yeah. it's not something i would want to do again mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, I know exactly why they can't get staff, all of that stuff. So that was nursing homes. Then two weeks before Christmas 2019, I got terminated mm -hmm. for really, really silly reasons. Like 
and I'm not kidding, I didn't put enough of the right colour baubles on the Christmas tree. And I was I was on probation, like I was a th- I was three months into this position, yeah. and they really just needed an excuse to get rid of me and my supervisor at the same time because they were they were hemorrhaging money, mm-hmm. and this is a common thing in nursing homes. Yeah. So lifestyle not being essential, we got the chop. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, and we were told, both of us were told that we should have been able to read the minds of the management staff. <laughs> so it was, yeah, okay. So I'm not going, at that time, that point in time, I thought, no, I don't really want to go to, back to that field. Yep. <clears throat> and three months later, after I'd started piano teaching again, I was off my blood pressure medication. Mm-hmm. So it just shows you that the stress, you don't realise it at the time. Yeah. But you when you are under that stress all the time it does affect you physically. Yeah. So that was a surprise to me because I sort of knew I was under stress but you don't realise yeah. how bad it is until you are out of that. So the music school at Kenmore that I teach at was advertising for piano teachers. So yeah. I applied and got the job and absolutely love it. I've been doing that for nearly two and a half years now and absolutely adore it's like having 30 or 40 grandkids <laughs> that you don't have to have sleepovers or anything you see them for a half an hour or 45 minutes every single week yeah it's it is such a privileged position mm-hmm. um and even more so now because of all the mental health it's like you know some some of these kids they don't like going to school they're having troubles at school or at home or both yeah and, and you get them for a half an hour a week. It's a very um, influential spot yeah. to be in because you can actually feel that you can help them yeah. just by being nice to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so I love it. I don't really want to give that up, but I am willing to do that for Australia. Okay. And uh, so what, what was your um, decision, I guess, to, uh, to run for politics? And can you tell us, obviously about your party and the position that you're a candidate for. Okay, so Blair is my electorate, Mm -hmm. which takes in just south of Ipswich, up around the two dams, Wymanhoe and Somerset, Mm -hmm. and it goes up as far north as Jimna, which is west of Nambour, for anybody who knows geography. So it's actually quite a large electorate. Mm -hmm. Um, The main city is Ipswich, but there are a lot of little towns as well. So I didn't, in my mind, it wasn't, um, I'm going to become a politician. Yeah. It was Easter, like 12 months ago, there was a clip on YouTube, uh, Sky, Sky News YouTube. We don't mm-hmm. even get free to wear um, Sky News. I was watching a clip on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I think it was David Limbrick, or it could have been John Ruddick, mm-hmm. was talking to the presenter about the Lib Dems Mm -hmm. and A, whoever it was, sounded so intelligent and I thought, well, that's that's a really intelligent politician. Yeah. And B, what he was saying was so sensible. Mm -hmm. So it was like, "Mm." and at the time, Queensland or Brisbane had been um, put into a snap lockdown just at Easter, you know, how we missed Easter those two years. And I thought, well, I'm going to look up that website, that uh, political party mm-hmm. because I, I at the time it was like oh I haven't heard of that political party yeah why haven't I heard of that political party yeah so I looked them up and read about them and then I realized that I have actually heard of them David Lionhelm mm-hmm. I had heard of him back in when he was in yeah in but because Senate. it was removed from us in Queensland I didn't remember yeah but when I read his name I thought oh yeah I remember him yeah and then I read about the philosophy and I thought, well, I'm actually a libertarian. <laughs> yeah. I never knew it before. Like, I've never known that word, but mm-hmm. that's the philosophy behind it. So then I looked up libertarianism and I thought, oh, that's what I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I am different. Mm-hmm. At one of my nursing home jobs I applied for, um, they interviewed me quite a few times. The boss wanted to, be, to keep talking to me. And at one of my interviews, I said, because she was saying, well, can you lead the team? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a good leader. I'm, I'm good different. I'm like Aldi. <laughs> and she <laughs> laughed. She thought that was so funny. And I did get the job, yeah. and I was a good leader. Yeah. Um, my team 
used to introduce me as their fearless leader, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> which I think you have to be to be in politics. Yeah. You have to be fearless. Yeah. And you have to be a good leader. Yeah. So that's Blair. That's how I found out about the Liberal Democrats. Mm-hmm. And when I joined, okay, so I read it, read it. I thought, yep, I'm going to join them. Paid my $80 membership. Mm-hmm. Um, got my welcome email. And the week after, Campbell Newman joined. Mm-hmm. In, actually, in my first emails with the secretary at the time, um, she said, oh, I think Campbell Newman's going to join too. So I thought, well, I'm on the right track. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not a Campbell fan as such as in when he was Premier. Yep. I would have voted for him yep. because that's the side that I'm on. But it's not like I'm part of the, the fan club. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for him. He's yep. a really nice person as well, yeah. which I didn't know until I joined the party and met him. Yep. I had never met him. And yeah, he's a he's genuine. Yeah. Yeah. So then I thought I am on the right. I'm in the right party. Yeah. So just to clarify, it's the obviously the Australian federal election 2022, and it's the lower, yep, lower federal house. house that you're yep. yeah that you're running for. Correct. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, well, t- speaking about David Lionhelm, I mean I had a fair bit to do with him because he helped me with a few issues on the firearm front, um, and he was an absolute, in the words of Campbell Newman, a champion for for gun rights and shooters here in Australia, which I, I agree completely with that. Um, what I like about him is he's very articulate, um, you know, obviously well-spoken, knows his, knows the information, and um, and he didn't let any of the media get him twisted. Yeah. He was able to, you know, um, be very articulate in uh, getting his message across. So yeah, a lot of respect for him, and I'd love to see him run again. I really would, but uh, who knows? But uh, speaking of him, I mean, obviously that's where I got to learn a lot about the LDP myself, and in particular the firearms policy, which from my understanding is, you know, the use of semi-automatic firearms, so rifles, shotguns, handguns, you know, for um, recreational shooting, hunting, you know, target, um, and even to the degree of self-defense. Now, I, I understand that not everyone in the LDP, obviously, is, as we say in the shooting world, a gun guy or a gun girl. We, we get that. Not everyone is. But I think the main thing that we would like as shooters is someone who, one, is a member of a party with a, with a gun-friendly uh, policy, but also willing to, to learn and listen. Um, so uh, in saying that and understanding what the policy is for the LDP, I'd like to get what your thoughts are on, on the whole firearm law issue and, and firearms in general. Okay, so I, I don't know whether you'll call me a gun girl, um, but I'm actually very pro-guns. Mm-hmm. I've never actually been in the same room that I know of with a gun. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it would be a great thing if all teenagers in our high schools, Mm -hmm. and I know Bob Catter said this recently, had training on firearms. Even if it's only one kind of firearm, Mm -hmm. you know, and the experts would say, well, this is the one they should learn. Um, They wouldn't be necessarily firing real bullets all the time, but they could be taught, this is what this is, this is how it works, this is how you do it. Um, And the safety issues, Mm -hmm. you know, just, and I think that, more than anything else, that would actually solve some of the problems of the hysteria. Oh, yeah. we can't have guns, we can't yeah. have guns. Yeah. Because if, <clears throat> if the kids are all being exposed to it um, and people older than me know about the history of, of that, it was a thing back in the day. It was when um, I was a kid, absolutely. It was a, it very much, I mean, you used to go into Kmart and you used to be able to buy um, you know, little semi-automatic twenty two rifles. Um, Where were you a kid? You know? So, so here in Australia, oh, yeah. okay. You just think I'm. I, you just think I'm younger than what I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do vaguely remember in Kmart, but I would yeah. never have really spent any much time in that section of yeah. the shop. Yeah. Um, I do vaguely remember that. Yeah, you used to buy your ammo there and all that yeah, sort I of vaguely, stuff. Yeah, you know? I vaguely remember that. But because we lived in the city, yeah. we really and we're not. Um, I'm not from a, a shooting family. Like yeah. my family are both farming families, but yeah. dairying. Yes, they probably would have had a gun, yeah. and my uncle yeah, would have definitely. had a gun for his farm. Yeah. But the other side were agricultural, mm-hmm. so they wouldn't have had much use for guns. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, so I am pro 
sporting, mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah. Um, the other question was the semi, the actual licensing thing. Uh, so yeah. <coughs> so basically, just to clarify, so obviously you know, obviously someone who's a member of the party will have to believe in the party principles and everything mm. and, and the policies which we understand the firearm policy is that but yeah it was more so just getting what your personal view is on it and the and the other uh last part to that question is that you know we as shooters really just want a politician who even if they're understandably not into firearms is willing to listen so next time they're trying to take more from us uh, without any justification at all because that's the problem these days is they take without justification there's no incident um, to justify yeah. it they just go yep it's a new year beat our chest let's uh, come up with some more gun restrictions and then tell mum and dad in the yeah. leafy suburbs of Brisbane yeah. what a great job we do well I think I think I agree with a lot of what Campbell said when you interviewed him the mm-hmm. other week um, there should be complete transparency yeah and if even for the existing rules, mm-hmm. the the reasoning behind those rules needs to be made public. Yeah. Because if it is anything other than, um, we need this rule because evidence shows X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Then the rule shouldn't be there. Yeah. Yeah. If if they cannot show this rule is beneficial because of this. Yeah. The rule shouldn't exist, and yeah. I think that's that's libertarianism to yeah, a T. Definitely. If you don't have a reason for that rule, the rule shouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, you know, like protesting, for example. Mm-hmm. A licensed gun owner should not be stopped doing stuff just because they have a gun license. Yeah. Where yeah. is the evidence that they are any more of a danger? It's like the vaccination <laughs> ridiculousness. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Where is the evidence that an unvaccinated person is going to cause harm to yeah, to I the agree. cafe or blah blah or the shooting range? Yeah. Blah blah blah. Yeah. There is no evidence, so that rule should not exist. Yeah. And it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm very very clear on that, mm-hmm. and I, I have no patience or tolerance for fools. Yeah. And if they, you know, I don't know how I'll go if I get voted in because there might be. Some might have to deal with some fools. Yeah, I think um, you will. Yeah. You know, I've lost my train of thought now. Well, yeah, if, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, um, you know, so speaking of that, something that, uh, you know, I, I, I explain to a lot of people that I, I speak to that doesn't require a great deal of knowledge about firearms, and I'm looking at it federally because obviously you're running for a federal seat. There's no point in me talking about the state laws because that will be something that you will have very little, if any, influence on whatsoever. So, uh, you know, federally, I mean, one of the biggest frustrations that I've got is you can be licensed here in Queensland, New South Wales, any of the states or territories, you can be licensed for a semi-automatic rifle, for example. So um, you could be a uh, firearm collector, uh, you can be a um, firearm instructor, uh, then obviously you can be like myself, primary producer or feral pest controller. Uh, there's a few different um, genuine reasons that a person can have a semi-automatic uh, rifle. The problem is, however, federally, and they know it, is federally because 99.9% of the firearms come in from overseas, all they need to do is tighten up the import laws and then that stops people here in Australia from having firearms that federally they don't want us to have, even though we're licensed to have it. So what I mean by that is when importing through a dealer a uh, semi-automatic rifle, there's only two occupations that can do that, feral pest controller or a primary producer. Um, So both of those uh, occupations are the only ones that can get an import permit from the Attorney General's department to be able to, uh, to to bring a semi-automatic rifle in. So even though you're licensed here as a collector or even a firearm instructor, you can't, you can't purchase a, a brand new semi-automatic rifle. Um, you have to wait until there's a second hand one on the, on the market here that some farmers had for 20 odd years and goes, yeah, I'm selling it now because I'm going to get a new one. Keeping in mind, I mean, firearm instructors here for anyone who's doing a safety course, which is mandatory to get a license, um, they're the ones instructing civilians coming in doing a safety course and even they can't buy a, a brand new semi-automatic rifle to conduct the safety courses with. 
that's probably one of my biggest frustrations uh, federally. Um, and the fact that if you're licensed, um, why can't you then access what you're licensed for? So I just wanted to get your view on that. Well, this goes across a lot of a lot of different areas. Yeah. So it's the same thing that I would be asking for anything. Why? Yeah. And it's the same. It comes back to that transparency. Mm -hmm. So whoever is making those rules yep. needs to be able to explain why mm -hmm. intelligently. Yeah. Why can you not, like if you're the collector, mm -hmm. why? Yeah. Why have they put that rule in place? And if it's some, like, I'm not deep down into the conspiracy theories. I'm yep. really not. But if there is a conspiracy, yeah. then they have a reason to hide the reasons. Yeah. If there's no conspiracy, why can't they explain their reason? Yeah. Yeah. I, look, I agree completely. I mean, that... that and that's where I would... You know, that's what my view. And yeah. it's like, it's very frustrating. And it's, it's any time you have something silly happening, the first thing I say is, why? Yeah. Why? And I expect to be explained and, you know, have the proper answer explained to me. Yeah. And I know, like... <laughs> When you have a little kid and all they do is ask why, 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 you get annoyed with them. Yeah. But that's their way of learning. Yeah. And to me, a leader learns and asks why Yeah. and admits, well, I don't understand why mm -hmm. you have made this decision. Explain to me why. Yeah. Um, rather than the leader pretending that it's all okay yeah. and that they understand why without... Yeah, that's why they waffle on all the time because yeah. they actually don't have an explanation. Yeah, that's right. They go round and round. I mean, the, another thing that's very, very frustrating federally with regards to the import laws, and there's a lot of shooters that will go, yep, when I say this, is federally they have a cosmetic appearance uh, ban. So if a rifle looks um, similar uh, or even if it's black in colour, has like what's called a pistol grip stock. You can have various different uh, flavours of the of the month that they don't like. Uh, it's banned from import. It gets classed as if it's a semi-automatic uh, rifle. So even if you've got a bolt action rifle uh, or a pump action rifle or something that is manually operated, um, they can ban it on appearance, on its cosmetic appearance only. Which to me, my personal view on that, goes to show that the gun laws are not about public safety, but about the personal hatred of certain persons in the Attorney General's Department or Home Affairs um, with their personal hatred of firearms. Because how can you justify from a public safety point of view uh, on the appearance of something um, to, to ban it? I mean, that's... I mean, if it was a person, you couldn't do it because of racial, dis yeah. you know, yeah. uh, racism, <clears throat> discrimination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's fine with firearms. Um, so, you know, I'd like to get your your view on that as well, if we could. Well, again, I'll say, why? What? Why? How do they justify doing that? And yeah. I think a lot of conservatives, even though I'm not actually a conservative, I'm a libertarian, which is a different thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think my husband is conservative, mm -hmm. and he has spoken mm -hmm. about this issue because we've talked about it yeah and i think it is a fear and it's like the same the hysteria thing yeah it is a fear of if somebody gets hold of um a replica yeah. that looks like it could be a dangerous weapon mm -hmm. they might go out in public with that well how often does that happen yeah. and where is the evidence yeah. that that has happened where did it happen how many people were scared out of their minds. Yeah. And if it did happen, if, if somebody was that stupid, yeah. I mean, I know we, we have mental health issues, but if somebody was that stupid and had a replica and went out in public and people thought it was a real weapon and the police shot that person, well, he, he, he chose to go out in public yeah. with that, yeah. knowing that it looks like a real weapon, mm -hmm. It's like you have to take responsibility, and that's libertarianism. You yeah. take responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. So if you've gone out in public with a replica firearm and gotten yourself shot, then yeah. sorry, that's yeah. your fault. Yeah. You yeah. can't punish a whole law-abiding section mm -hmm. of our community because somebody else might go off and do something stupid. Yeah. 
that's where I feel. I know some people might think that's harsh and all the conservatives, they might actually say, oh, but you have to protect the society. Government's job is not to protect yeah. people. Yeah. People's job is to protect people. Yeah. It's like I'm getting a lot of emails, blanket emails from this motoring organisation of people picking up the email and sending it to all the candidates and it, it gives them a couple of options for road funding. And one of the options is um, my my issue is to keep my, me and my family safe when using the roads. Well, I'm sorry. Using the roads is a risk you choose to take. Yeah. You have to accept that there are risks. Yeah. Everything we do carries a risk. Definitely. Me driving up your driveway <laughs> carries a risk. Well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. <laughs> it's like I hope I get back out but anyway. Oh, it's easier getting out. You'll be okay. fine. You'll be just fine. Yeah. Yeah, everything you do has a risk. Yeah. And it is not the government's job to remove every risk yeah. from life. Yeah. Um so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what about your uh views on uh COVID and the way the government has uh handled that, Michelle? I know that uh the Lib Dems, um, you know, obviously are very much into freedom, so I've got a fair idea of, of how you respond to this, but I'm all, always very interested to get a person's view uh, on the whole situation and, uh, and how the government, you know, has handled it. The whole situation, well, barring the first maybe even six months, when, like, even the first three months, I was scared. Yeah. And I don't scare easily. Yeah. I was when it was coming out of China, yeah. and and you know the reports were oh people are dying yeah. left right and centre, mm -hmm. and there was that footage of that person supposedly collapsing in you know walking along the street. Yeah, I was frightened. So okay, yeah, let's let's be frightened for a short time, but then when the evidence started coming out that it wasn't killing all and sundry. Yeah, it was killing vulnerable people. Yeah. And the death rate was only, a, you know, very small. Mm -hmm. Then the government should have actually been looking at that and being far more sensible. Yeah. You know, this this whole it's very obvious now that it's just been a, a total power grab. Yeah. It's been to grab as much power as they can have over us. Yeah. Like the um, emergency laws, yeah, state of emergency powers. laws. Yeah. That's just uncalled for the, yeah. there is no state of emergency yeah and it's the same comes back to why why do you think this is a state of emergency mm -hmm. there's no emergency in ipswich yeah um so that's one side of it the power the power grab um then i'm big on thinking about unintended consequences even though i i personally cannot think through all the unintended consequences myself i know there are a lot of people especially in the liberal democrat party they're so smart they can think through all the unintended consequences mm -hmm. and our politicians have have either chosen not to or are too stupid yeah. to actually be able to comprehend there are on un unintended consequences there's been a lot of trauma yeah. and trauma leaves scars. Yeah. We were flooded in 2011. I've still got tr scars from that trauma. Yeah. And my kids probably still have scars from that trauma as well. Um, my husband's reaction to the flooding a month ago was very interesting. So he's got scars from the trauma, trauma mm -hmm. in 2011 too. Yeah. Um, I've got this little student, one of my youngest students, I think she's five now, she started late last year when we still had the indoor mask mandate. And of course, because we're in a small room, we had to wear masks. The teachers wore masks. She didn't have to because she's little. Yeah. But then after about five or six weeks, that mask mandate was removed. Mm -hmm. And the first time she came in for a lesson and I wasn't wearing a mask, she could not stop staring at me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I wondered why she was staring at me. And I'm smiling and, and she's going like this. And then I realised, oh, we don't have a mask on. Yeah. That's deep. And that's happening to all the little kids. Yeah. Who've had, you know, all the adults around them wearing a face mask. I know there has been studies overseas of this is actually affecting their brain development, their social development. Mm -hmm. Um, I know my students are 
are affected from from the last two years. I can see the difference. But yeah. anyway, we won't necessarily get into that. That'll yeah. take a long time. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, what if uh, you're successful in you know being elected? What will be your priorities? Um, you know, in, in the lower house, what's what's something that you would like to prioritise? Well, if I get elected, I will be part of a, a small, I don't know how small, hopefully not too small, mm-hmm. number of uh, crossbenchers. Mm-hmm. So it'll be, you know, anybody from UAP, One Nation, Liberal Democrats, Australia Values Party, if they're doing, yeah, they're doing lower house candidates. Mm-hmm. So any candidates from those kind of parties that are successful will form a crossbench yeah. And we will be able to influence the legislation. Yeah. So anything that comes up that has got unintended consequences, we'll be able to get up and argue yeah. and say, no, this needs to be changed. Mm-hmm. So, And the other thing we could do is actually make public mm-hmm. the legislation that is being mm-hmm. discussed and pushed yeah. through. So, for example, the um, digital identity. Mm-hmm. In a general sense, that will be my biggest priority. Yeah. We cannot have a digital identity. Yeah. That is just, a, no, that's going to happen over my dead body. Yeah. Um, so that's a general thing. But in terms of Blair itself, mm-hmm. if I was to be lucky enough and honoured enough to be elected, my priorities are the water flood plans, mm-hmm. the um, inland rail. Yep. We should not be having inland rail from Toowoomba to Brisbane. Mm-hmm. That's just, it's again, why? Mm-hmm. I come back to that stupid question, why? Yeah. When it can be taken to Gladstone and it makes much more sense to do that. Yeah. Who is deciding this on behalf of ruining our Lockyer Valley farmland and putting a railway line through floodplains? Yeah. It's just, it's just so sensible, isn't it? No. <laughs> why? And then drilling like kilometres of tunnels. Yeah. That costs a lot of money. Yeah. And the first time I said that to um, my friend who used to live in Toowoomba, I said, well, that's all slip land. Mm-hmm. I don't know the engineering behind all that, but it, it can't be easy or yeah. cheap. No. So that's the second priority. Um, I would really like to see some programs in the Blair region for um, drug addiction, you know, mm-hmm. rehab kind of facilities and maybe boot camps. Mm-hmm. So I know that's not specifically a federal area, Mm -hmm. but the Lib Dems policies would create a little bit more money available to put into the local communities because we're going to cut the waste. There's so much waste of money at a federal level. So, you know, the duplicate departments and um, defunding the ABC. (laughs) You know, saving a lot of money. You'd have a lot of shooter support on that one. Yeah. Well, they should look at the Freedom Manifesto. It's all there. Yeah. There's an actual real plan rather than our main parties. They don't actually lay down, this is what we want to do. Yeah. The Liberal Democrats published that months ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. So this is something that I do, I've spoken about until I'm blue in the face and I think shooters are finally getting the message about how important it is to help out on election day um how important it is to you know write to local members um you know you've got to be active in activism so to speak so what would be your advice for everyone who's watching this at home how can they help you come election day um how do they get in touch with you and do you have any other recommendations for them you know, in the pursuit of freedom. Okay. So first of all, I will say I totally understand that people are over it. Mm -hmm. They are cynical. A lot of people have a hatred towards all politicians, including me. So I've been at markets and some people are really quite aggro when you offer them a, a flyer or even just greet them and say hello. They will just walk past and you can tell they just cannot stand even countenancing talking to anybody who wants to be a politician because they tar everybody with the same brush. Yeah. And that's a real crime, I reckon. Not a real crime. That's Our current politicians have caused this problem because they are so, I don't know, 
Well, they don't give listen. it a word. Yeah, they um, don't listen. They just no. smile on election day. And the way they yeah. treat each other. Yeah. You know, they set such a poor example. Mm -hmm. So I get why people don't want to have anything to do with politicians or people who want to be a politician. But yeah. now, this election in particular, there are a lot of high quality people going for it with integrity. Yeah. And integrity is probably something that the current politicians lack. Mm -hmm. Some of them. There are some good ones. Yeah. You know, like Jared Rennick, um, David Lionhelm was great. Yeah. You know, some of, you know, Pauline Hanson does stand up. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Catter. There, we do have some high integrity individuals, yep. but in terms of party politics, this is why we need the small parties in, yep. because we are not bound to a party um, position. Yeah, we can actually represent our constituents. So, having said that, the easiest thing people can do to help all small party candidates is follow them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's easy. And like you've got a lot of followers. Oh, not that many. Yes, you do. I've got, I haven't even got 400 on my Facebook page yet, right? And I'm really proud that I've got nearly 400. And I'm, I'm, when I nearly got to 200, I thought, oh, I'll make a video. But I don't know how to do this stuff. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, well, if I get to 400, I'll make a video. But if all of your followers followed my Facebook page, it'd be really interesting because Facebook would probably shut it down. Possibly. They'd yeah. probably say, oh, she's got tens of thousands of followers. We can't allow that. Possibly. Yeah, so you, that you would be really interesting. Work, so. Yeah. So anyway, follow me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, yes, polling day. I will need people at polling booths. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be there all day. Just a couple of hours yep. would be wonderful. There are 59 polling booths in Blair. Yeah. So I've got about, I really shouldn't say how many. I've got a lot less volunteers than that. Yeah, I need definitely. more volunteers. Yeah. It makes a big difference if if I can get a how to vote card and a friendly face into you know to greet the voter. Yep, hundred um, percent. Definitely. There's two weeks pre polling. My husband and I are going to be standing on a pre polling booth eight um, ten hours a day. I think it is. Yeah. Like I'm doing the morning, he'll do the afternoon. But that's only one pre polling booth. There are a few pre polling booths. Yeah. So if you can give a couple of hours on a pre-poll booth in the two weeks before would be great yeah. and it's fun i've been waving i've got sore shoulders because i've been standing on the roadside waving my <laughs> sign but it's fun people people wave and you the little kids even wind down the windows to wave to give you a wave and it is enjoyable so what i would like to finish with is serious mm -hmm. the time for sitting at home thinking somebody else is going to fight for your freedoms is gone. Yeah. We have to stand up and fight for our freedoms if we want our freedoms. Definitely. We we might not ever get them back. We are so lucky to be in a, a democracy. I mean, Australia is still one of the best countries in the world yeah. to live in, but it might not stay like this. Mm -hmm. So this is why I'm fighting for my kids and my little students. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Guys, look, I'll say in closing as well, I've said it before, I'm going to keep saying it, we need to get involved, not, you know, start to get involved. Immediately, we need to get involved. You have people here like Michelle, who's just like any of us, you know, has, has, has our job, has our interest, has mortgages, that sort of thing. Um, and we have good people who are standing up, who are actually going to listen, um, not just on the shooting front, but just in general. Um, make it happen. Contact uh, yep. Michelle, get in touch with her via Facebook or whatever. Just use uh, a bit of initiative. Look up her details there. Give her a uh, page a like. Get your friends involved. And let's just start getting out in numbers because I can assure you from the times that I've handed out how to vote cards for Cata Party, for One Nation. You know, I'm, I'm standing there and I've, I'm there by myself. I have no one from the shooting community that I've represented in the last 10 years there helping me. And yet I see the Greens, the Greens of all people, with numerous people at every, every polling booth. It is an absolute embarrassment that we have one million licensed uh, shooters here in Australia, in my view. And yet on election day, where are those shooters? There's like point what zero one percent of us 
like myself who actually get out there and do something on election day. So guys, how about we all join together and start putting politicians in power? We've got the best opportunity now in my view, because as yep. you say, people have had a gutful, um, not just the shooting issue, it's about COVID, it's about the loss of freedoms. Um, we have the best opportunity now in my view to make real change. Let's put the majors last and put people like uh, Michelle and the LDP first, uh, CADA, One Nation, all the rest of it that you've yeah. spoken to, and actually get politicians in who will listen to us. So, Michelle, I really appreciate you coming out and uh, giving me your time uh, today, and I wish you all the best uh, you know, on Election Day. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for your good luck, good sentiments. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No worries. <laughs>